Hello, true believers, and welcome to the Comic Book Club. I am your host, Jamil Payne. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Amanda Comey. How are you, Amanda? I'm doing great. I'm ready to have my heart broken over and over again. I mean, just constantly, like, ugh. (laughs) <laughs> Ooh, like just um this is like the definition of dark and gritty. Like <laughs> Yeah, this is a this this is prime late eighties comic book club episode where we're dark and gritty and mysterious and um We're still ready fresh. to Yeah, we're still fresh and new and not <laughs> landing to the fucking ground. <laughs> um Yeah, so do you want to talk a little bit about the book oh, you yeah, chose yeah. for this week of course of course um i have it all written out right here um th- today we are talking about daredevil issues 27 through 33 which makes up the legendary storyline born again it is a marvel comic written by frank miller and drawn by david mozzarelli i had to look up that name how to pronounce that by the way um the letter is by joe rosen with wonderful inks by christine matt shelley it ran from February to August of 1986. It tells the story of Matt Murdock, a.k.a. Daredevil, and his descent into madness after his arch enemy, the Kingpin, finds out his secret identity and systematically destroys his life. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good um, summary of what we're about to read. Well, talk about, discuss, cry, maybe. <laughs> um, so, had you read, had you read this book before you recommended it? No, I've been saving this for a special occasion. A special occasion? What what constitutes a special occasion for reading a comic book? Uh look, I knew look, I've had these ideas for this show for a long time and I was just I don't know, it is weird, right? 'Cause I I've I have the first three volumes of Frank like I have all four volumes of Frank Miller Daredevil's run, right? Okay. And, like, I read the first three. This is technically the fourth. And I just didn't read it for some reason. Like, I just stopped. Like, I was like, I don't know. It's just like I felt like I was saving it for something. Okay. I mean, I sometimes um, save books until I know I'll have a full afternoon when I can just sit down and, like, read the whole thing. Um, And sometimes that day never comes, and eventually I just have to read it one issue at a time just to just to get through it um then it doesn't help that i have like you know a thousand and one like a thousand and twenty yeah trades. so yeah. You, so sometimes you say okay i'm gonna come back to this and sometimes it, after a while i just get lost in the shuffle yeah so did you read this all in one sitting or did you read it over the two weeks or oh oh it took me oh i don't know maybe five days to read it I basically read like an issue, maybe an issue and a half a day, because there's a lot here, and like, mm-hmm. especially the first few issues, it's kind of depressing, and like you know, I'm I, and I wasn't for sure if I wanted to keep reading. It's not really something you're like, oh, I'm enjoying this. Like it's good, it's great. I'm not for sure if I enjoyed it. Yeah, I read probably the first half. Um, up until, um, about halfway through the story, Matt's presumed dead and he's recovered by, um, a nun. And at that point, I think I realized I'd been holding my breath and I just needed to like stop reading for a little while. (laughs) Um, just, it was put together so well that it was so easy to keep reading it. And I didn't realize how much it was affecting me because this is a very raw nerve type of story but it's also kind of gets at insecurities which are really specific to being an adult and like i don't know if i would have appreciated this story at all if i was younger do you know what i'm saying yeah so now that you're all old and grizzled you you definitely appreciate is what you're saying (laughs) well i think um like once you like once you graduate high school as an adult you kind of like forever have these nightmares that oh i need to turn in that english paper that was due 10 years ago and i still you know, have like, those I'm, dreams right right so this is kind of um like the adult nightmare like 
the bank lost my mortgage payment and I got fired from my job and the IRS is auditing me and my ex is sleeping with my best friend and no one will listen to me and everyone's out to get me. Like that is a very specific type of adult anxiety that everything in your life that you thought you had under control simultaneously just kind of like evaporates and everyone else's life is still going on and you're just kind of left behind. Um, it's a super real anxiety. Um, the, the type of fear that doesn't really come out in most superhero comics because most of them are like, it's a villain who's going to attack the entire city or the entire world. And that's not a problem that I have, but the bank losing my mortgage payment is absolutely a problem I could have. And like, and there's no trace of it whatsoever. Like, there's nothing you can go back and look. Like now, like it's weird, right? Because now, um, in the digital age, there's always a check and balance. You know what I'm saying? But could you imagine, like, back in '86, if they lost your mortgage? There's no electronic trail. You. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's no copy. There's no extra like digital copy. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's even worse. Um. Did it? Did it? I mean, like, did that? Did that strike you also that maybe I – ju I just had the very real sense that if I'd read this book when I was 20 before I really had a lot of bills to pay or responsibilities, I would have read it and been like, oh, yeah, this is just kind of like some weird abstract psychological horror thing. And instead, it's, it's sort of um, – It's almost too real. It's almost like the last – like home invasion horror movie we saw the whole time all i could think about was like no that crown molding is so expensive it's going to cost so much to fix that <laughs> like home alone is a horror movie as an adult because you watch it and you go oh my gosh it is that house is beautiful it is going to cost so much to fix all of this <laughs> that house is worth like that house is worth like a million and a half dollars i looked it up one time right right so this just struck at a very, um, very real, very, like, character-driven horror. <laughs> um, loss of, like, loss of willpower, almost. Like, loss of agency. Yeah, like, you know, just no agency over, like, one's life whatsoever. You know what I'm saying? Like, he, one minute he's, like, in the big mansion and within, like, oh, excuse me, a giant penthouse and within the span of, what, 25 pages? Mm -hmm. He's on the street, like yeah. like like it happens so quick, so fast. Like it makes your head spin. Like how quick it happens. So before we talk about how he reacted, how do you think you would have reacted in that situation if if the universe suddenly conspired against you and took everything away from you? Like, what do you think you'd do? Do you um, have any idea? <laughs> I, I I have none because like now I got a wife and a kid. So if if all that is taken away from me at once, I don't know how I would, I don't know. Like, shit, Amanda, that's dark. <laughs> I will, I mean. Well, well, I get just, it. No, no, I get yeah. it. The book, the book takes you into those places. Like, that's what makes it so good. Like, like, like you know, we haven't talked about the meal of the story. We're just talking about the existential crisis yeah. of your life being out of control. I don't know. I, I don't, I mean, I'm trying to think of what I would do also. I, I mean, yeah, I, I literally can't imagine what I would do, but I know that emotionally I would react a little bit like Matt. Like I would, I know that when I get frustrated, um, I can take it out on the people around me and I can have a very short fuse. And like what we see in the story is that just like, turned up to an 11 right yeah like um there's a moment where he's on the train and this is a story that um kingpin's assistant related to him that there were some punks on the train robbing people and matt ignored them and then when they started to mess with him he beat them up and then when a cop finally showed up he also didn't stop and he beat up the cop too and then he ran um, and that sort of, like, mistake made 
when you don't have the energy to really like check yourself seems like very authentic also. And now I now I'm just wondering like where Frank Miller how he was able to come to this under this very real understanding of that like emotional situation. Um well, I don't know anything about his life, so well, well this is well I'm gonna tell you something. Um mm-hmm. You know, so 86, right? I was almost two years old when this came out, right? Yeah. And, like, you know, how it's always related to me about Frank Miller's 80s career was he did Daredevil, and then he did Batman. And, like, and like his Daredevil was, like, you know, his, his like, prototype before he did Batman, right? Like, he worked out the kinks before he did batman right Mm -hmm. so in my mind born again always came before batman what you know dark knight's returns which dark knight's return along with Watchmen in 86 is is considered like you know the two comic books that changed like the industry right like 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 yeah those two books have those reverence what but like i looked at i looked at the dates right he did this at the exact same time he did dark knight's returns they both started in February of 1986. Wow. And, like, for all the credit Watchmen and, mm-hmm. and Dark Knight Returns gets, this, I think, in my opinion, might be a better story than Dark Knight Returns. But, like, and everybody always talk about, like, how legendary it is. But no one talk about how much of a game changer this particular book is. Like, you can you read this you can see the 30 years of influence it's had on comics yeah absolutely and i i think that's just kind of like i think this should be mentioned in the same breath as those other two books i mean this book starts with this man's ex-girlfriend selling out his secret identity for a hit of smack heroin and that yeah. shit just mind blowing. And like, like this is a character. Karen Page was a character that was in the comic books before this story. So it, it's, it's like I said, it's dark and gritty without fear and force. Like you know, when people say dark and gritty, these are the stories they should be talking about. Yeah. Um, it's funny that you say people don't talk about this series very much. Um, no, they talk about it, but they don't talk about it as it being a game changer. Well, right. So I, I mentioned this in my local store this morning. Um, the, the guys who work there are always, um, they, they're always willing to do like the extra two minutes of banter to find out what you're reading so that they can flip better things into your pull box um but uh i said i'd read born again and they were like oh yeah that's amazing um one of the guys when i was there two weeks ago said that it was just hands down just like literally the best marvel book ever so it seems like as soon as you bring it up people remember that it was like really crucial and really amazing um but that uh, maybe because Daredevil isn't like a top top tier character, they kind of forget about it. It's weird, right? And like, like you- as soon as you bring it up, everyone's on the train, and everyone's except me before two weeks ago has heard of it, and they're like, "Yes, this is the best." But they don't. When people are thinking of like the best stories, the classic stories, I feel like they always go to like Batman. And watch me. Those yeah. are the two. And look, I would say the guy was crazy to say, like, this is, like, the best Marvel story. Because for me, the two best Marvel stories has always been God Loves, Man Kills, and the Dark Phoenix Saga, which are both X-Men stories. I think, like, like, like you, know, I, I, you know, I just got done reading it this week. I need to, like, you know, go yeah. over it a little bit but I think this might have just jumped to number one on my (laughs) list. But I got to give it time, but, like, it's it's so damn good. Like, like, and, like, it's so sophisticated. 
like for its time you know what i'm saying like just everything with foggy and matt's ex-girlfriend like there's like real complicated human emotions within this book and like it just strikes you because because when you think of the 80s you don't necessarily think of that even in shit like you know the dark knights returns you don't think of like these like complicated adult dynamics you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. um i think one of the other aspects that really makes this a top tier book is the art and the layouts because we've mentioned before how um we both have a little bit of a learning curve when we go back to older comic books yep just because the style was different even as recently as 10 or 15 years ago and comics from the 80s are almost a different language and this was not only so readable but almost every single page was like perfect i don't know how this could have been laid out better or more efficiently it just I, I'm trying to think. There were a few splashes that were really amazing, but just the individual. Uh, it was just so, <laughs> like I wish. I wish they could write history books like this because then I would know about the real world the same way I know about Hell's Kitchen, right? It just goes straight into you without any filter. Um, it, it goes straight. To, it's, it's uncut. Goes straight into your veins. Maybe yeah. maybe that's not appropriate with, with this story being about Karen Page. But, yeah, it's kind of like that. Um, I think one of my favorite sequences was when Matt was unconscious and he was retelling the story of his accident. I mean, and we had so much – the the pages were set up with a vertical panel that was his face in the moment and then horizontal panels that were layered – lettering of him remembering the story and him narrating now it was just so well done it's striking Uh, it it stays mm -hmm. with you yeah um no it was and it's funny because um i had not heard of this artist before well dave mess i shit dave mess really is a legend i yeah but i mean i i'm newer to comics in the last 10 years and I haven't read as much of the older stuff and knowing like I'd never wanted to read Batman year one before now knowing that he was the artist I'm like yes please more that that more like knowing that he's the artist more than the writer would make me read more books and I I was completely not expecting this to read so well. Like, this is kind of timeless. Like I said, don't worry. You was going to read Batman Year One. That, that, that's going <laughs> to dock it at some point. <laughs> right. No, um, I, like, I was actually worried about you with this book before you read it, believe it or not. Like, okay. I was like, because, look, here's the thing, right? You're, you're a woman, and you're a modern woman, right? And, like... You know, um, modern day, you know, people tend to, not complain, I don't want to say complain, but people tend to have, like, are, are, like, more sensitive Mm -hmm. about how women are portrayed, you know what I'm saying, nowadays, which they should be. So I was worried that the book would turn you off because, you know, Matt got sold out by his junk, by his junkie ass girlfriend. Like, I, I wasn't for sure how you was going to react to that. Um... I mean, that's not my favorite part of the story, (laughs) but it doesn't, um, it's one of those things where it's not like treatment of women in specific stories that bother me. It's just kind of like aggregate trends. Mm -hmm. So like, this is an amazing story that just happens to not have many female characters that do interesting things, um, which is fine. But if you looked at, like, all of the stories that were written in 1986, like, you know, I would hope that half of them have women in them, and that's probably not true. 
So yeah, that's the part not. that bothers me. It's, it's not like – like there's no specific story that I would ever yell at for being like this – this story is not feminist enough. I hate this crap. It's kind of just like overall. Okay. Well, because for me, this story only works because of that. Just for the sake yeah. of fa- Because, like, here's the thing. It's so fucked up. Like, <laughs> whether it's feminist or not, it's so fucked up in real world that it's like... that. Look, I'll put it this way. My heart goes out for Karen Page in this story. Like, it goes out, but, like, I not necessarily know women like Karen Page, but if you, like, look at it, she's a survivor, right? You know what I'm saying? She's, she, 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 she did anything she could to get back to Matt, and she did, like, some unspeakable shit to get back yes. to Matt, and, like, I applaud the story for not shying away for that. Like, I, I, I really do, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, you know, I feel like now, nowadays, they would shy away from something like that. But, like, it's very... I, f- I feel like... So, actually, I feel like... Um, I feel like nowadays it would either shy away from it or it would show us too much. Mm, okay. So, I'm okay with being... Like, this was sort of done in, like, almost like a PG-13 rating where you are left to understand as an adult the unique horrors that she went through as a woman trying to get herself out of Mexico and back to New York city. Um, But you are not shown any of this. I am. I believe that if someone was doing this now, they would be marketing the shock value of that and they would be asking the artist to draw it. Right. Right. And I don't need to see that. No. Having that as an element of the story where I have, like, a little bit of control over how much I dwell on that, I think is um, – I think that's I – th- I really like that, actually. I think that shows a little bit of restraint. Also, and if they shied away from it – and, like, if they didn't shy away from it, if it wasn't a shock value – I've mm-hmm. also I've also seen this in like other medium too, where like they dwell on well they may not show it, but they dwell on it too much because they want to make a quote unquote three dimensional, which just makes it worse. You know what I'm saying? Like, like like you know this is like you said this is just the right of, right of mount that you understand that like basically she's prostituting herself out to get back to America. Yeah. And she has absolutely no other choice. Like this this is the only way. This, do i forgot his name has the drugs is it has, Pao, is it, it's it's like paulo or something yeah. like probably the first mexican name frank miller could think of oh but. definitely definitely <laughs> but yeah like you know what i'm saying she's a junkie so she needs a fix and she needs to get back to america what what six thousand miles you know what i'm saying like to 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 like to like new york like upper east coast and it's just yeah. like and like you just read this and you're like oh my god are they and he goes there. Like, he really does goes there. I'm just like, I applaud it for that because, like, that's real. Like, everything mm-hmm. else in this book, like, if it was just that, maybe it's a problem. But it's just one more, like you said, real thing on top of all the other real things within this book. There is almost nothing supernatural in this book aside from Matt's powers. Exactly. Like, that, that's maybe what makes it... I, I it, it almost sounds like like it was a writing prompt or something like tell a superhero story where <laughs> there's no super villain and there's no like super weapon and there's no like superpowers like do do that and that's what they did um <laughs> yeah and it got super super scary um uh, so should we talk about the coloring in this book? The coloring, yeah. Which um is done by um Christine uh Max Shelley, a woman. She does every issue but one. Okay. And I think the colors in here are like beautiful. Yes. There were a lot of there were so many pages where the colors really brought it out. Um, I'm trying to think of a specific example. 
did you have anything in mind, or is it just the overall? Just over well, um, the the scene you talk about with the overlay of him telling his origin. In time, they do have Daredevil, and there's very little Daredevil in this story. Like mm-hmm. like the way the shadows cast on him, like it's actually kind of bright. Um, the the covers, like the covers, are real good. <laughs> the, the covers are insane. <laughs> um, I think. Yeah, I think the coloring just, it was so, yeah, I'm I'm going back and looking at a few pages to see if I can articulate it. It was surprisingly bright colors. Like, it's bright, it, it, it's like, exactly, it's bright. Very, like, high contrast. Like, like, it's very bright, but very dark at the same time, and it's hard to explain what that means. Like... Like it's odd. Like, like, like it's just I don't know. It's 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 perfect. Everything about this book is perfect, except for one <laughs> thing. Except for one. There's one thing about this book I don't like, and this is not a Frank Miller thing. This is a Marvel thing, especially back then. The fact that we have to recant, uh, re excuse me, retell their devil origin every <laughs> damn issue, like at the. Yeah, I know what you mean, and that's why 80s Thor is my favorite, because Thor is the only character where that makes sense. <laughs> um, but no, I know what you're saying. Like, every issue somewhere, they have to have, like, Within the first after five all, pages. Yeah, after <laughs> all, I'm the daredevil, and even though I can't see anything, I've got superpowers, or, you know, like... Ben's Ben the reporter is walking down the street and he's like, I wonder if anyone else knows that Matt is the daredevil, the man without fear, the man without vision, the man with super senses that he got after an accident. Like They even did with Karen Page, like they did with Karen Page when Matt finds her, like the very next issue. Like she recants. I'm like, Jesus Christ. The the thing is though. You so you had read the previous volumes of this, but I jumped right in, uh-huh. and I mean I don't know that I was grateful for that level of exposition, but um, I don't know. You do need to occasionally make sure that everybody knows what's going on. But in every comics. issue, like <laughs> every issue, and here's the thing, right? Comics are serialized, <laughs> but this is, like, super serialized. And it's uh-huh. just, like, you don't need it every, like, you know, you, you're you not going to come in halfway through this story. <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't you love if there was, like, um, I don't know, I feel like this would be, like, a, a Deadpool thing where, you know, Deadpool retells his origin story, like, at the beginning of every page. And people are like, what are you doing? <laughs> And he's like, oh, the editor said I had to drop in my backstory for the new readers. Um, but, yeah, I just uh, – and, and it's something, like, people don't do now that I often, thank God. But, man, that, that was a little tedious. Like, it got to the point where, like, I didn't necessarily skip over it, but I just kind of glossed. you like, oh, okay, here we go. Here it comes. Like, I can just well, – And that's why I think – um I find that it actually matches Thor very well because all of the Asgardian characters sort of have like this hilarious pseudo Shakespearean way of talking. And so like they'll show up and they'll be like, oh yes, Thor, God of Thunder, Prince of Asgard. And so you get all the exposition just sort of naturally in their stilted dialogue. Um, but in, you're right in this, it was a little bit, uh, a little bit obvious. So, um, what do you think of some of the characters? I mean, we, we, we've talked about Matt and Karen, but what do you think about some of the other characters in this book? Um, I found, so I found Kingpin to be very interesting in this book. Um, that to fat, see him, go ahead. I was to say, that fat fucker is terrifying. <laughs> yes, yes. But to also, to see him as, like, a man who has emotions and also has control over them. Like he, um, he knows that Matt will figure out it's him and he knows that Matt will come after him and he knows that he'll get an opportunity to beat the crap out of him 
but he also knows that he can't kill him. He could. He's, he, you know, Kingpin is immensely, like, super strong. But he doesn't. It's sort of like, what if, what if, like, a Zen guru attained enlightenment and then decided that what you do with it is take over the world? <laughs> um, so I found it. I found it even more chilling to realize that this version of of Kingpin has human desires and human drives, and yet is a master of them. Um, it's um. I also find that like I also love that everybody in New York is corrupt. Like everybody in New York is fucking yeah. corrupt. Like like, yeah. like it's almost omnipresent how like how much control the kingpin has in this story like like everyone is in his pocket right from like generals to senators to like reporters like reporters mm-hmm. on in the daily beagle cops <laughs> nurses he's just like shit is anybody cleaning this city like <laughs> well and there was the there was one cop near the beginning of the story who was clean and then his son was sick and that was how kingpin was able to manipulate him which, again, I, you know, like, we hear stories all the time of people's children's, people's children get sick, and then they need to start GoFundMes to take care of their families, and it's just such a real fear. I just, I just could see myself, like, if I was actually a character in this book, I would be one of those people that Kingpin, you know, sends a check to in the mail, and then I do something. <laughs> Oh yeah, definitely. I wouldn't be a hero. I would be like non non player character number seven that like poisons his meal at the diner or something. <laughs> and like he always gets you as like your most vulnerable. Then like he was talking to the one general. Like was it the general? Was it the someone? He was like, yeah, those pictures that you you were doing some unspeakable things. Like Christ. Like, yeah. <laughs> um. It, then like it was the one guy where he was just like um who questioned his authority and he was just like you know what uh there's gonna be a check for your shares take it then he was like yeah wesley um go break his legs <laughs> yeah it's just um want to talk about well hold on i just want to touch on foggy i love that like somehow foggy um somehow foggy who is kind of like a goofy character <laughs> Is always constantly a romantic rival for Matt Murdock. That makes me really happy for some reason. Yeah. Like. <laughs> a suspension of disbelief. Broken. No, not necessarily. <laughs> not, you see, you see, see, no. You see, that's the thing. It's not, that's why I like it so much. It's like, like, like in most stories, right? Whether it be TV, movie, or anything like that, right? Mm-hmm. That dude wouldn't have no chance with anybody. But Foggy is like a powerful lawyer in New York. You try to tell me he ain't got no qualities that women like. <laughs> you try to tell me this immensely successful, kind-hearted man <laughs> has has no pull with women. And I like that Frank, like, no. I like that Frank did that. Like, nah, like, Foggy is, like, attractive in his own way. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Like, Yes. We know Matt Murdock has the abs, but he, obviously he's not mostly available. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, Fog is always going to be there for you. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I I just you know I also I also liked his I also like Glory um that one scene where she's taking pictures and Ben tells her not to stop taking pictures. Yeah. And like <laughs> in the prison cell, like that was awesome like that was almost cinematic in a way you know what i'm Mm -hmm. saying like as like all this gunfire is going around like people are getting shot and killed being beats a a person kills a person by pistol whipping them and you just hear click click Mm -hmm. click 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 and she never stops (laughs) and the um that was a scene where the art and like the um the click 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 was so powerful in that scene because there was no dialogue 
it was just the um, the sound effects. Yes. And yep. so you like you like almost felt it, like you felt it go silent, and it was just the click, womp, click, womp, click, womp, click. And, and like it's like this touch of dark humor to it because it is funny that she doesn't stop. Then like then like like then like then like it pulls back and you just see all the carnage around mm-hmm. <laughs> around it, around her and Ben is on the floor t- horrified about w- what he did and all you hear is click. <laughs> it's like yes, yes, this is this is all good. Like this is this is wonderful, man. I I can't speak highly enough of this book um do you want to talk about the Chris, the christian symbolism like the heavy 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 christian symbolism in this book um you know i i wouldn't mind doing that because i think it was done at a level that wasn't obnoxious <laughs> um because like that i'm sitting here and i'm like what christian symbolism and then i was like oh oh yeah all of it, everywhere, <laughs> got it. Well, look, I'm I'm going to read um the, the, this cup, these two paragraphs from the Wikipedia, right? Okay. It says, "Born again makes you heavy, makes heavy use of Christian symbolism." Because I was like you, I like what Christian symbol. I mean, it's there, but it's weird, right? It's not like it's not invoked in the way you would think, right? Hmm. Okay, he said, while the story is set during Christmas season, it follows Easter themes almost exclusively. The splash page on the first four chapters all show Matt Murdock laying down. In chapter 2 and 3, he's in the fetal position, followed by him assuming the pose of a crucified Jesus Christ in chapter 4. The flash, the, the splash page of chapter 5 shows him standing, representing the the, the rising of Jesus. In chapter 3, he is wandering through hell's kitchen, Parallels Jesus walked through um, Goliath. I don't fucking know. Include the three <laughs> falls. Include the three falls represented in the stations of Christ, of, 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 in the stations of the cross, before culminating in the image of the Peter. Sister Maggie takes the role of the Virgin Mary, both there and on the cover of the graphic novel, on which a dove, traditionally used in Christian artwork to represent the Holy Spirit, is posed above her. All the chapter titles, excluding those of the story arc, 20, uh, 32 and 33, are names of Christian concepts. Yeah. So it's all there. It's just... we. But it's, it's there in the... Most tasteful of ways, right? It's there in the most... Right. It's, it's the, there in the same way that, like, every superheroes like every story is like the hero's journey it's there in like an archetypal way not in like a um i would compare it to the worst example possible which is narnia which is like you're reading a great fantasy story and then suddenly you're like wait what and it just the story falls apart because you're like okay i get it the lion's jesus and then 50 pages later you're like okay i get it the lion is jesus can we stop now and, uh, and what is it? Peter is uh, is it Peter? Is is he the one that betrays them? I I don't even remember, but I just know that um, Narnia oh. Narnia is a fantasy series that was ruined by hewing too Close. closely to the story of the Bible, which doesn't have a great plot. <laughs> it, it it really doesn't. It really doesn't. Like oh, you no, know I'm saying you know definitely six out of seven for the story of the Bible. <laughs> and we just lost five fans right there, right there. We just lost I, five. I I don't know that that we lost five fans right there. We only got uh. about twelve. So, <laughs> but no, um, it's it or I give you another example. Uh, the Jesus allegory in Superman is heavy. It is super heavy. Like, yes. It's just, but this doesn't do that. It doesn't like like you know if you didn't know that right. You wouldn't think anything of it, even though there's a lot of churches in here. It just there's just a lot of churches, period, right? Like you wouldn't think, but like you wouldn't think that like it would have like you wouldn't think you wouldn't see the like, the heavy religious overtones if somebody didn't tell you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, or maybe we just a bunch of heathens and we don't follow the Bible close no, enough. No, no, no. I I feel like my. My impression of Daredevil before going into reading this particular story 
was that there that he was a character that was imbued with like just a tinge of of Christian symbolism. Um, like he's the savior of Hell's Kitchen. Like that seems um the, in a very generic way. Then like, you know, it is the generic um, Daredevil posing him on the cross. Like, you know, Mm-hmm. There's a lot of pictures of him like hugging crosses and shit. Yeah, and a lot of churches. Um, so it doesn't seem out of character for the story. And again, it was done. I mean, like I noticed that the titles were all, um, yeah. But it's not. It's not like super heavy-handed. It's still a good story with or without that. Um. And, and he definitely, like, and, like, this is something they do in the show. Like, like he definitely has, like, a kind of Catholic Jesus, like, like, um, complex where he feel like he must suffer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, he feel like he must get beat up. Like, a lot of Daredevil stories, like, ends with him just having this shit beat out of him. Like, he wins, but he's always worse for wear. And, like, yeah. And I wonder, does that start here? Is this, like, the first story where, like, Matt has to go through hell, like, to come out, to come out stronger on the other end? Should we talk about the last two crazy-ass issues of this book? Like, um, when, yes. When it becomes, like, a suit. Okay, so. <laughs> this is the only time I got super uncomfortable. It wasn't that, you know, Karen Page was a crack whore or Daredevil being... <laughs> like homeless and not control of his own life and being stuck in a car underwater. No, it was none of those horrors. It's when Newt jumps off that plane and just starts a mass shooting. Like, oh Lord, no. No, it's just like Yeah. Like you would never use that as a plot now. Right. It, yeah, it was um I mean we started off uh, obviously, I was more impacted personally by the things that could plausibly happen to me, like being audited by the IRS. But um, Amanda, yes, having Amanda, a man. What? It's 2018. You being audited by the IRS and getting <laughs> and, and and being called a man shooting is almost equal at this point. Go ahead, continue. Yeah, no, you're <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, having someone just having having a having a wannabe Captain America jump out of a plane and imagine that civilians are the enemies of capitalism and that he's got to kill them all to save America. Like, what? What? I... Oh. And you won't say, oh, that's too dark and that's too heavy-handed, but this is 1986. Mass shootings wasn't a thing. Like... (laughs) So when I said earlier that the challenge was to write a story with, like, nothing super powered or magical, um, I take that back. In the 80s, this would have seemed like a supervillain type of move, not just, like, a plausible thing that could happen. And no, that um, – and the way that Kingpin manipulated that character was also um, – just kind of brilliant in terms of like revealing the motivations of like Kingpin and Nuke. Um, Because he convinces him that, you know, like he's being a good American, he's being a good capitalist, he's working for the greater good, and that all of these people are just like passing laws to stop him and that they're the real enemies. That is, that is some fake news right there. It is. It, again, I like you know we've been reading. I feel like a, the last couple of stories we read, last two or three, feels like there was they were ahead of their time, and this definitely feels like one of those stories where it's just like, oh, Frank Miller predicted this thirty years ago. I mean, maybe that's just you know writers are allegedly sensitive to to how people work. Maybe that's just what happens when you understand. <laughs> how people work you see where it's headed true true but yeah like like at that point when he does that and actual superhero shows up but i and like you know they, they use captain they didn't use captain america much but they used him in a 
they used him like perfectly i think in this story like it's just enough captain america because of course this story has to involve captain in the in the universe with captain america you have to involve captain america if you're going to use <laughs> a nuke like you know what i'm saying and like I yeah think, and i think they did it perfectly i think you know just the right amount it also shows that you know with captain america they've been going to the same story well for like 50 years about about <laughs> him not understanding his government and how his government is so shitty now <laughs> Yeah. And he constantly had to do things to break the law, not because he wants to, but because his government is terrible. Yeah. Yeah. No, there is sort of overall this really, I can find a very inspiring message in here, which is that, like, despite what happens to you and despite what the actual laws are, that there is sort of this, like, central morality like central drive like there is there are people doing good despite what the rules are despite what happens um like in some way it is a bit inspiring it's not only a raw nerve in the negative way it's also a raw nerve in the positive way like matt does not give up Ben does not give up. Um, Captain America does not care about the rules. He cares about what's right. Hell, Karen doesn't give up. And also, yeah. like, oh, man, look, when when he finds her and she's crying on the ground, then, like, the next, very next issue is still them, like, embracing, but they're inside of a room. And she just looks terrible. Yeah. But, like, like, I, like I, love redemptive, I love redemptive stories and people coming back for the brink. And the way he brings her back from the brink is beautiful. You know what I'm saying? And to the point to by the end, they're back together. So, think. I think it's amazing. Um, I ended up getting it via Comixology because what? because at the store, the only Daredevil volumes they had were the huge ones, and I wasn't sure that I wanted like that much daredevil in that much daredevil in my life on my shelf um i need it <laughs> like i kind of want to see these pages and hold them in person and this is also this fits squarely in my central interest in comic books for adults that are more than cape stories like this is a book that i could give to somebody to stick it to them to say oh you think comic books are immature and for children and just an ip source for generic action comedies they're not they're art and they're real stories and it would be much easier for me to let someone borrow it if i could stick it in their face physically <laughs> And just hold it there and say, "Look at it! Look at the colors! Look at the contrast!" Look, look at just look at the way like the layering is laid out. Everything mm -hmm. here is perfect. I I was just consistently surprised by, I mean, because frequently you get a good story with okay execution, or you get a really straightforward, simple story with very good execution, and this is just everybody working so well working together like were frank and david like best friends were they like college roommates to be able to work together this well i know um frank asked for him i believe okay i think don't quote me on that yeah i i don't want to get creepy but i feel like i need to know more about who they were just because i I want to understand how I can ever cooperate this well with someone in my life. <laughs> well, um, now remember now, this is um, Frank Miller at the height of his powers. He had been doing Daredevil for years at this point. Mm. You know, this is after like Bullseye and um, you know Elektra dying and all of that. By the way, Matt Murdock kind of found out has like the worst taste in women. Like, you know, like, you know, you always see stories about how women have bad taste in men, which is true. But you really ever see the flip side of that? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you you really see the flip side 
of a man that just has like the absolute just terrible taste in women right uh you know electra is an assassin that that sometimes wants to kill him and 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 sometimes love him you know uh karen page who turned into a junkie and sold his identity out and um he um he also had a relationship with typhoid mary which is like a villain who's just a straight mm-hmm. up villain so so matt has this thing where he always trying to save like these damaged deranged women that's kind of like his thing <laughs> um there was a a limited run that i read a few years ago i picked it up because the art was very interesting i think it was written by bendis mm-hmm. um that was about daredevil being dead and the reporter ben going around trying to find it was rumored that he had a son with one of those women okay and so it was essentially like ben trying to piece together what matt's life was like at the end and he goes and he like at some point visits like all of the women that he had affairs with and it's just like this this man had a thing for redheads who were gonna kill him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the one that I um thought was kind of the funniest uh pairing was Daredevil with Echo, who is like deaf Daredevil. Yep. <laughs> and it's just like I was like, wait, really? At some point someone thought we should have the blind guy with superpowers hook up with the deaf lady with superpowers. And we basically have like, the same powers, like... Yeah. Um, and I... But yeah, so it was just... Um, it was beautiful artwork, but the the plot wasn't super... The story wasn't super compelling. Um, but, like... Because it was just it was just Ben being like, all right, which one of you ladies had a baby with Matt? And they're all like, not me. Well, like, but like, and I they re- were all terrible, and I was like, "Really? He hooked up with all of them?" Yeah, like that's that's Matt. Look, I um I remember um when season two of Daredevil came out, we uh me Jack and Kyle, you know the other show I do, the Jack Random show, we talked about it, right? And Kyle talked about how how unlikable, like you know, uh, Electra was in that in, in the show. And he like I don't understand why Matt would like want to save her or always around her, and me and Jack like just told him, well that's Matt. Like, there's even <laughs> Matt in the comic book. Like I don't know what to tell you, Kyle. Like this is kind of what Matt does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that, yeah. He has a thing for like terrible. Look, look. That's why Glory um, left him. She she was just way too good for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She had her stuff together. And you know he, and you know he can't, he can't abide by a woman having their stuff together. He gotta save them. <laughs> the fact that there's not a lot of Daredevil in this Daredevil story, mm. like, like what we, like he's Daredevil. What the first issue, and like the last issue maybe. Yeah. And that's it. Like for the most part, there's, there's no Daredevil in this story. It takes a master writer to not have your superhero in your superhero story and still keep it interesting yeah that's um that's a very good point all right amanda i think that's a good stopping point so do you have a recommendation for us for next show um yeah so i got a few suggestions from the guys at the local store today um including maybe some books we'll get to later like skyward or something by brian azarello um yeah but I, I think we need to take a break from the gritty for just a just a bit <laughs> um but yeah i um i mentioned i was so excited about david mascelli's art and the owner of my local comic book store recommended that we read alan moore's promethea with a uh, jh williams on the art so um let's just look at something beautiful for next time Okay, and uh, how many issues of that are we reading? Let me let me check Comicsology, just cause, cause uh, you want to do the first twelve issues? I think this. Um, issues, that I mean that sounds about right for getting a a good feel for the book. 
Um, it's, I feel like it's kind of a a disservice to look at less than six, but um, I would be comfortable looking at the first 12. All right, then. So, so in a couple of weeks on November 4th, wow, we're already in November. <laughs> uh, wow this and it man we, we are going we are we are reading Promethea written by Alan Moore with art by J. H. Williams issues one through twelve. Now Amanda, if anybody out there in in the podcast sphere wanna reach us, where can they? We are on Twitter as Comic Book Club fifty two. You can also email us comicbookclub52 at gmail.com. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook um, as the Comic Book Club. Probably the least popular one, but uh, you yeah, should be able yeah, to find com- us. Come <laughs> to find out we're not the only comic book club. Maybe I should have checked that out. But fuck it. We're here now, so <laughs> we're going we to ride this out till we get a cease and desist letter. <laughs> Well, and then we'll we'll rebrand as the the all new, all different comic book club fifty two. Goddamn right! All right then, I am Jamil Payne for Amanda Comey. We are out.